Developing right now on Morning News Now, a fierce fight in the heart of Gaza. This morning, Israel intensifying its ground assault in the south, where they say Hamas leaders are hiding. Now civilians say they have run out of places to flee. And here at home, some of the top universities in the country in the spotlight on Capitol Hill over a startling spike in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia on campuses. Can you but not say values, here that it is also, against the code of conduct at Harvard? We embrace a commitment to free expression, even of views that are objectionable, offensive, hateful. We have team coverage from the Middle East to Washington. And breaking overnight tragedy in Texas. At least six people killed, several others injured, and a suspect in custody in a series of shootings across the state. What we're learning from officials. Plus, the stage is set for the fourth and final Republican primary debate. We'll take you to Alabama for what to expect and how the outcome could impact next month's Iowa caucuses. And who run the world this morning? Forbes is out with this year's list of the world's most powerful women. Some names you'll be familiar with, while others might surprise you. We'll go through the rankings with one of the senior editors at Forbes. There was a little hint there with some of the... <laughs> You're going to sense a theme this morning when it comes to lists. <laughs> oh, I think, perhaps. Is that so? Maybe. We'll see. We'll That's see. That's something for our next hour, right? Yeah. Exactly. Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for joining us. We begin with the latest on the war between Israel and Hamas. This morning, Israel is intensifying its assault on southern Gaza, fueling an increasingly dire situation for Palestinian civilians. Israeli officials described the fighting Tuesday as the, quote, most intense day since the beginning of the ground operation. Soldiers operating in the heart of southern Gaza's main city, Han Yunus, engaged in house-to-house -house gunfights. As the assault widens, so does the humanitarian crisis. The United Nations says more than 80 percent of Gaza's population has been displaced place since the start of the war. And Gazan health officials say the death toll has now climbed past 16,000. With food, water, and medicine in short supply, the World Health Organization says the situation is getting worse by the hour. For more, we're joined by NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez in Jerusalem. Raf, good morning. So the United Nations is warning a, quote, hellish scenario is about to unfold in southern Gaza. Israel says this is the most intense fighting yet as they push into the city of Han Yunus. What's the situation on the ground right now? Well, Joe, good morning. I think hellish is an apt description right now. As you said, we are seeing very, very intense fighting street by street in the city of Han Yunus right now. And the hospitals down in the south of Gaza are overwhelmed. Our team has been at the Al Nasser Hospital. It's one of the main medical facilities down there. They say there is just a never ending flow of wounded, dead, dying, arriving, trying to get treatment there. And as well as the Hamas leaders, who Israel says are hiding in Han Yunus, there are hundreds of thousands of Palestinian civilians, many of whom fled from the north, and they are facing unbelievably painful choices right now, literally life and death decisions, trying to keep their families safe. I just got off the phone with a man named Mohammed. He's a Palestinian British scientist who actually went to Gaza in mid-September. He is now in Han Yunus. He says they are hearing ar artillery falling all around them, and they are having to decide. There's 30 people in his family staying in a three-bedroom apartment. They're having to decide, do they go south and try to get to safety? Do they stay in their home? and risk being encircled by Israeli troops. And he says at this point, going south would be a huge leap into the unknown. They don't have enough cars to get the entire family south. They're going to have no shelter when they get down there. They don't know if they're going to have any access to water. And those decisions being faced by Palestinian families all across the south right now. The Israeli military says it is putting in place temporary pauses in the fighting at certain hours to allow people to get out, to allow humanitarian aid to get in. But the question we were hearing again and again and again from Palestinian civilians is where are we supposed to go? Guys. Raf, also yesterday, members of Israel's war cabinet met with families of Israeli hostages. Of course, one of the other big stories here, the meeting has been described, though, as chaotic by at least one person who attended. What can you tell us about this? Yeah, Savannah, this was a fiery encounter by all accounts. Uh, there is a lot, a lot of frustration among the families of the remaining 130 or so hostages inside Gaza. They feel that time is running out, that their loved ones are sick. Many of them were wounded on October 7th, that they are not in good health, and that 
time is ticking by and sooner or later it's going to be too late. And they feel that the Israeli government is not doing enough at this stage to get their loved ones out. Remember, we have not seen any Israeli hostages come out of Gaza since last Thursday when that ceasefire collapsed. They want the Israeli government to restart negotiations. They want to see people coming out again. And one of the big frustrations is they feel like they know what the price is going to be. Hamas is going to demand thousands of senior Palestinian militants be released from Israeli jails. And the families are saying, do it. Let them out. Give Hamas what they want. Bring our loved ones back. This can't be about politics. This has got to be about the hostages. And so, yes. we're after touching on this, but tell us the latest about negotiations at the moment. Is there any communication between the two sides on this? There's nothing official. That's according to the White House. We had seen a sort of formal process playing out in Qatar in the weeks leading up. To that week-long ceasefire, you had officers from the Israeli intelligence agency, the Mossad, sitting down with Qatari officials who were then shuttling across to talk to Hamas officials inside of Qatar. We're not seeing that formal process going on anymore. The Israelis have left. It's very possible that there are behind-the-scenes talks going on. Qatar says it is still trying to mediate another ceasefire. But right now, there's no expectation that we're going to see one today, tomorrow or anytime soon. Yes. Ralph, a spokesperson for the State Department, Matt Miller, said that Israel isn't doing enough to get humanitarian aid into Gaza. Real quick, how is Israel responding to those criticisms, and is the U.S. exerting any pressure to try and get more aid in? So the U.S. is calling every day for more aid to go in. The Israelis say they are allowing more aid, but we are just seeing these vast, vast shortages. Uh, this man, Mohammed, I spoke to, he said, They've been struggling to get flour, to bake bread. They haven't been able to find eggs in a month. And we've been seeing people breaking into UN warehouses, searching for food because they're so desperate. And it's a dynamic you see in a lot of war zones that even if there is food on the shelves, often now the prices are so high that people can't afford to buy it. So without fuel to supply the trucks to distribute the aid, a lot of it is just piling up, and it is not reaching the people who need it. Guys. Right. Raf Sanchez. Raf, thank you so much. Well, this morning, investigators in Israel are revealing eyewitness and victim accounts of women brutally sexually assaulted and killed during the October 7th terror attack. President Biden called the accounts appalling, a warning some of the images and stories you are about to hear are graphic. NBC's Hala Garani reports. On October 7th, Hamas attacked within Israel's borders with a wave of terror, murdering over 1,200 people, including entire families. And Israeli investigators say there is growing evidence that Hamas unleashed another kind of horror against women. Something so uh, horrific happened, um, and the world should know. We spoke to Mirit Ben Meir, who's helping lead the investigation of allegations of repeated rape and sexual assault by Hamas. Where does your investigation stand? Uh, we have uh, eyewitnesses that are slowly uh, arriving and giving testimonies. Disturbing accounts about October 7th, including this woman describing how a Hamas terrorist, quote, laid a woman down. He is raping her. Then they pass her on to another person, telling investigators the woman was alive and bleeding. Another chilling eyewitness account from Yoni Sadon telling the Sunday Times he was at the music festival where Hamas slaughtered hundreds of Israeli concert goers. He hid under dead bodies, saying he saw a, quote, beautiful woman with the face of an angel and eight or ten of the fighters beating and raping her. When they finished, they were laughing, and the last one shot her in the head, he said. Hamas has denied committing sexual crimes against women. Israeli officials say the investigation is challenging because most victims were killed. But among the evidence seen by NBC News, graphic photos of women's bodies with obvious signs of sexual assault, including some naked from the waist down. Some of the terrorists that are interrogated, they're saying that this was happening and this was done. First responders describing naked female bodies tied to beds. 
NBC News also reviewing this Hamas document that Israeli officials say was carried by Hamas militants on October 7th with instructions on how to say, take off your pants in Hebrew. The UN facing backlash for its response, some deemed too slow, including this protest Monday. Critics blasting the Secretary General for taking seven weeks to publicly call for an investigation of Hamas and sexual violence. And the agency UN Women for not putting out a statement until last Friday. The agency telling us in part, within days of the horrific attacks, UN women began offering concrete support to the UN Commission of Inquiry, which is investigating these matters. We feel like the world has turned their backs. Miriam Schler runs a rape crisis center in Tel Aviv and says Israel's critics are downplaying, even dismissing alleged Hamas sexual violence. You say that people can be opposed to what's happening to Palestinians, Absolutely. but at the same time they need Absolutely. to be you sympathetic. Can, yeah, I mean, I, the, there's two things that don't to have to women. do with each other. I feel for the suffering of Palestinian civilians, it has nothing to do with the fact mm -hmm. that there can never, ever, ever be an excuse for rape. And President Joe Biden at a fundraiser condemned the, quote, sexual violence by Hamas, saying the world cannot look away and adding that these acts must be condemned without equivocation and without exception. All right, Hala Gorani, thank you so much. At a fiery hearing on Capitol Hill, the presidents of three elite universities were facing tough questions about the rise in hate and anti-Semitism on their campuses. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk has the story. Recognized for five On Capitol Hill, the presidents of three top schools, MIT, UPenn, and Harvard, Witnesses grilled over a spike in anti-Semitism on their campuses. Professor. Your university is a hotbed of it. At the center of the hearing, tension over how to protect both student safety and free speech, while combating anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Disagreements about the conflict in the Middle East should never escalate to threats of violence. Harvard's president was asked about pro-Palestinian demonstrators calling for intifada on her campus. Can you but not say here that it is also... against the code of conduct at Harvard? We embrace a commitment to free expression, even of views that are objectionable, offensive, hateful. It's when that speech crosses into conduct that violates our policies. In recent weeks, a number of Jewish students have told NBC News they worry for their safety. Why today a Jewish student is afraid to walk to the library at night? Congressman, let me start by saying I'm, I'm devastated to hear that and uh, the safety and security of our campus and our students in particular is my top concern. All three presidents are facing for criticism for their response to hate rhetoric on campus. Held. Each walked through new plans to combat anti-Semitism. Staff here at UPenn say they've received anti-Semitic emails and hateful slogans were projected on buildings. Now there's additional security at religious centers and a new anti-Semitism task force. Editors of UPenn's student newspaper spoke with us on campus. I think the important part is to have respectful discourse. People do feel, on both sides, kind of feel, feel like the, the space for open discussion and discourse has been lost. The presidents testifying on Capitol Hill told Congress they're fighting hard to get it back. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, Philadelphia. Breaking news this morning, at least six, six people are dead and two officers hurt after a shooting spree in Texas. Investigators in Austin say a suspect is now in custody. Officials say an officer was shot in the leg outside of a high school just before 11 a.m. Tuesday. Investigators say the same suspect then shot and killed two people in a South Austin neighborhood. Then last night, investigators were called to a burglary scene where another officer was shot and two more bodies were discovered. Investigators say they finally arrested the suspect after a high-speed chase ended in a crash. That suspect is also believed to be tied to another double homicide near San Antonio. And in Arlington, Virginia, police say a man whose house exploded in a massive ball of fire this week was killed in the explosion. Now we're learning more about 56-year-old James Yu and the events leading up to his death. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has the latest. Neighbors in Arlington, Virginia, feared this was going to end badly. Just after 8 o'clock Monday night, it did. A massive explosion lifting an entire home off its foundation. 
It started in the afternoon when police responded to reports that a man inside had fired a flare gun more than 30 times. That led to a standoff with a SWAT team armed with a search warrant. Then the enormous explosion that shook homes for blocks. We need all fire apparatus so we can get the houses exploded, I believe. I thought it was actually like probably like either uh, a car crash or like a plane crash. Police identified the suspect as 56-year-old James Yu, who several neighbors say acted erratically, covering his windows in aluminum foil. Police also confirm he posted online conspiracy theories. The suspect was inside the residence at the time the, of the explosion, and he is presumed at this point to be deceased. Thomas Joyce lived next door and says he wasn't surprised by the massive blast. He was not a... Um... Uh, stable individual. Police say you had no known criminal record but had a history of filing unsubstantiated complaints with the FBI. Police still searching for a cause of the explosion. Police and the FBI say this was an isolated case. There is no ongoing threat to the community. Ten homes were damaged, though thankfully no one else was seriously injured. Back to you. All right, thank you, Tom. Turning now to the race for the White House for the fourth time this year, it's debate night in the Republican race for that nomination. Four candidates vying for the nomination will take part in the final primary debate ahead of the Iowa caucuses. The debate's taking place in Alabama. Yeah, the candidates who qualified are Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy, and Chris Christie. The GOP frontrunner, of course, that's former President Trump, will once again skip the debate. He's going to hold a private fundraiser in Florida. For more on this, let's bring in NBC. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster. He joins us from Tuscaloosa, where this is going down. Hey, Shaq, good morning. Good to see you. So this is one of the final opportunities, of course, for the candidates to make their pitch to voters before right. things really get underway. Iowa caucus is just next month in January. So tell us what's at stake tonight. Who's facing the biggest pressure here? Yeah, look, when you look at the dynamics of this race, it really is about a battle for second place. But that battle has only grown more competitive in the past weeks and months and since the previous debates in this race. You look at Nikki Haley, for example. She has seen a rise in polling, especially when you look at some of those early primary and caucus stakes. She also has been securing some major Republican endorsements uh, from the donor community. So she wants to build on that momentum and show that she is truly a force in this race. Race, and that's momentum that has come at the expense of Ron DeSantis. You've seen his polling numbers slide a little bit. He wants to show that he's still a force in this race, that he still has something to prove, that he has something to show and offer Republican voters. And you also have Vivek Ramaswamy, Chris Christie. They have uh, had big presence on the debate stage. We'll see what kind of influence they have as they also try to make a name for themselves. You, you know, you talk about this uh, being a uh, race that so many people are watching. This is possibly the last debate before the Iowa caucuses. Each of these candidates want to have some sort of moment. It's not clear that they'll get it. So, Shaq, throughout the primary season, the candidates have essentially been fighting for second place to be the Trump alternative. Polls show the former president maintaining yeah. a sizable lead against the field for months. But beyond Christie, could we see the participants take aim at him, or are they going to keep focusing on each other and the current president? I like that you say beyond Christie because that is what is to be expected. He has very clearly made this about Donald Trump. You can expect him to continue to attack Donald Trump on the debate stage. Now, the open question, as you mentioned, is whether or not any of the other candidates will take the opportunity to go after the front runner on the debate stage. And that really is an open question. One thing that you can almost guarantee is that you'll hear them hit Donald Trump for not being on that debate stage. We've heard that uh, that line of attack come before uh, on previous debate stages. Whether or not they go after him on policy and specific positions, you will likely get some of that, but how much of that you'll get, that remains to be seen. King of the front runner, Shaq, I mean, we know Trump took part in a Fox News town hall. He's also gonna hold a fundraiser tonight. This is the first time we're not seeing any real counter programming against the debate from him. Walk us through right. that. Yeah, no live event tonight, although he had that town hall in Iowa yesterday. Look, he feels very comfortable in this race. And, you know, our uh, Iowa Embed talked to some of the folks, some of the Iowa voters uh, who were lining up for his town hall yesterday. Just listen to some of the conversations that were had there. And that gives you a sense of the confidence that Donald Trump is feeling. I enjoy his honesty. And if uh, 
You know, they say he's a liar, but I think of all the people that are, you know, offered, he's the most honest of them. He's more of a businessman. Uh, all these other people from D.C., the politicians, they scratch each other's back. Because he because he has a good economic track record um, with the way the country's going right now, um, you know, everything costs more. When he was president, you know, everything was a little bit cheaper. We were a little bit safer, I believe. That can give you a sense of why he doesn't feel the need to have some sort of live counter programming this time around, though. You know, Donald Trump, he will likely comment on the debate in some form. But he did say to one of our uh, campaign embeds just yesterday that he will not be watching the debate. He'll not be uh, tuning in. And that's likely because of that fundraiser he'll be having. All right, Shaq Brewster, I have a feeling we will be seeing a lot of you over the next 24 hours. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. After the debate, be sure to check out our Meet the Press special coverage for more analysis. You can watch it tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern. That'll be right here on NBC News Now, also streaming over on Peacock. Let's get the latest on all that rainy weather in the Pacific Northwest. Meteorologist Angie Lastman is here with us this morning. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Really impressive rainfall over the past 24 hours in portions of the northwestern United States. And because of that, we still have flood alerts that are up right now. Eight million people impacted from Washington into Oregon and into portions of Northern California where you see that bright green, there is a flood watch in effect. We've got more rain on the way and it's currently still raining in a lot of spots across this region too. From Spokane Valley all the way out to Mount Rainier, we've got Portland, Salem, Eugene, all dealing with the rain this morning and more to come as we get through the rest of the day today. Here's that system working closer to the coast and eventually bringing more rain, more snow across this region. We will see some of that snow developing across the Sierra Mountains. It won't be incredible amounts of, of snow, but still impactful nonetheless. By the time we get into tomorrow, that next system works its way uh, a little closer to the coast. That first system will work its way a little closer to the northern Rockies. So that means snow there and it means more scattered showers and a little bit of snow as well uh, across Washington, Oregon, and California, too. Now, the rainfall totals coming in anywhere from two to three inches for the higher spots. Of course, we could have localized amounts a little higher than that. And we've already got saturated grounds. We've seen a really uh, impressive river flooding yesterday. And I have a feeling through the day today we'll see more of that. But a lot of the rain is going to be focused a little farther south than what it was yesterday. So that's one uh, positive, I suppose. Now, as we get into Friday and beyond, we'll start to see this next storm system working its way from west to east. Friday, it works into the Rockies. We'll see some snow there. And then it kind of redevelops over portions of the plains, uh, bringing rain to folks in Kansas City, Wichita, and then spreading that rain across much of the mid, uh, much of the east, from the Midwest down to Texas. We'll see some rain and even a little bit of snow in the northern portions of mm. that, guys. All right. Welcome back. After months of delay, the Senate finally confirmed more than 400 stalled military promotions. It happened because Alabama Republican Senator Tommy Tuberville announced he would drop his hold on most military nominations. He's been protesting the Defense Department's abortion policy. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander has more on that, as well as a new clash in Congress over aid to Ukraine. A dramatic reversal after months of single-handedly blocking more than 400 military promotions for some of the country's highest-ranking officers, Alabama Republican Senator Tommy Tuberville is backing down, abruptly lifting his hold. I'm releasing everybody. I still got a hold on, I think, 11 four-star generals. Everybody else is completely released from me. Tuberville had been facing bipartisan backlash for holding up the nominations for months in protest of the Defense Department's policy that allows service members to be reimbursed for travel costs related to getting an abortion. Still, there's another clash in Congress that's threatening one of President Biden's biggest foreign policy priorities. <laughs> Ukraine. Ukrainian President Zelensky's top aid warning without more U.S. military aid, Ukraine faces a big risk of losing the war. Any member of Congress who does not support funding for Ukraine is voting for an outcome that will make it easier for Putin to prevail. There's been a fierce debate over that funding on Capitol Hill, with House Republicans insisting on accountability for American funds already sent to Ukraine and demanding that Democrats first agree to toughening restrictions at the U.S.-Mexico border. The battle is for the border. We do that first as a top priority. The Senate quickly confirmed about 425 military promotions, and President Biden blasted Tuberville's blockade as pointless. All right, Peter, thank you.
Well, law enforcement officials are warning about the increased use of a device called a switch. It's a small piece of plastic that can illegally turn a semi-automatic firearm into essentially a machine gun. NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian has more. Officer William Jeffrey knew danger lurked on the other side of the door, but he never expected this. Dion, it's Houston police. Let's do this thing. Before he could get those words out, cut down by a burst of gunfire. Somebody get Bill! One of many victims of what police say is a growing threat, firearms illegally modified to shoot like machine guns. My dad thought that he was Superman for Houston. He, um, I always said he had Superman syndrome. He thought that if he wasn't at work, the city was going to crumble without him. He loved being able to serve his community. Jeffrey's daughter, Lacey, still grieving, says she was stunned to learn about the weapon that killed her father. My father was shot more than a dozen times. Sorry. <laughs> um... The amount of bullets that he was able to fire off in a matter of 10 seconds, as opposed to only pulling the trigger once and having to reload and doing it again. My dad could have probably gotten out of the way. He probably could have moved, um, but he didn't have a chance because of the rapid fire. He didn't, he didn't stand a chance. From his perch at the head of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, Special agents. former federal prosecutor Stephen Dettelbach is the chief enforcer of the nation's gun laws. Now, machine guns have been against the law in the United States, new machine guns, since 1934, the days of Al Capone and the Tommy gun. But we're seeing them all over the place. Dettelbach invited us to a law enforcement gun range in Washington, D.C. to see how easily legal guns can be illegally modified and how dangerous those modified guns can be. This is uh, an example of a drop-in auto here. It's a machine gun conversion device. It looks like a small piece of plastic. It's yeah. deadly. The reason why is it just drops right into an AR and makes a, a, a lethal weapon. All you have to do is open up the AR, drop it in the appropriate place, close it, and you have a, an item that can kill scores of people in a second. And people are buying these online, they're buying these from overseas. They're buying these online, they're buying these from overseas, they're 3D printing them. Here's a standard handgun, one round fired for every pull of the trigger. Here's that same gun, illegally modified. Similar devices modify assault rifles like the AR-15. I talked to state and local police chiefs, sheriffs, uh, our partners in federal law enforcement. They tell me to a person. It's raining switches. Earlier this year, police in Pennsylvania were chasing a suspect Watch that corner. who had just killed a local police chief when he opened fire using a modified Glock. Move. Police killed the assailant in a shootout. Get on the ground! Let me see your hands! Authorities say switches like the one used in that gun have been flooding in from China, but also made at home. I sat in a room, a printer that cost just shy of $200 sat there buzzing in the background for 30 to 40 minutes, and when it was done, a machine gun had been created. An ATF report on crime guns found that the number of recovered machine gun conversion devices from 2017 to 2021 went up 570 percent. He was more than just a cop. Um, my dad was a great man. Lacey Jeffrey, who used to get rides in her father's squad car, is among those pushing for tougher penalties for criminals who sell and use modification devices. And if we can just harshen the punishments for these criminals that are getting caught with them and keep them behind bars longer, I feel like it, it's extremely important and it would be very helpful for our communities. Our thanks to Ken Delanian for that report. Well, meanwhile, several lawmakers in Washington are calling for the ATF to not only ensure those conversion devices are made illegal, but to also hold its creators accountable for any misuse of those weapons. Welcome back. You might remember a lawsuit that was filed back in October that allegedly a highly caffeinated lemonade drink from the restaurant chain Panera Bread led to the death of a 21-year-old college student. Well, a new lawsuit filed this week is blaming that same drink for a second <clears throat> death now. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa has the details. Cheers. 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 
Panera's Charge Lemonade is stirring up controversy again. Now with the family of Dennis Brown, blaming the chain bakery cafe for the 46-year-old's death last month. Calling Panera in a scathing lawsuit negligent, careless, and reckless. And alleging the company knew or should have known that the drink could injure people sensitive to caffeine, even causing death. Brown, who had high blood pressure along with the chromosomal deficiency disorder, developmental delay, and ADHD, ate at Panera up to three times a week in Florida and recently started drinking the charged lemonade. The drink, according to Panera's website, can contain up to 390 milligrams of caffeine. That's more than a Red Bull and Monster Energy drink combined. It does have caffeine, but I filled up this much with bubbly, so I'm only giving myself a little bit of caffeine. One afternoon, Brown had three charged lemonades offered side by side with uncaffeinated drinks, according to the lawsuit. While walking home from Panera, Brown suffered a fatal cardiac event. I think the general public believes Panera to be a healthy fast food alternative. And so it was completely reasonable for someone like Dennis Brown to rely on the fact that this lemonade was safe and safe for consumption and safe for consumption in refills just because they encouraged it with their unlimited sip club. The lawsuit filed Monday comes amid a social media frenzy over the drink's high caffeine levels. It's like a burning feeling inside. It's like I'm being tickled from the inside. And I'm still pretty wired, okay? And less than two months after Panera was hit with a separate lawsuit regarding an Ivy League student with a heart condition. That legal complaint says Sarah Katz died after she drank a charged lemonade in 2022. Since then, Panera told NBC News it enhanced our existing caffeine disclosure for these beverages. Now facing a second suit, Panera maintains, based on our investigations, we believe that the unfortunate passing was not caused by one of the company's products. We view this lawsuit, which was filed by the same law firm as the previous claim, to be equally without merit. What's your response to that? If this was really a baseless lawsuit and these people didn't really die as a result of this dangerous product, then why change anything at all? Emily Iketa, NBC News. We just heard caffeine can have deadly consequences if you have too much, according to some. But what is a safe level to consume? Yeah, plus the couple that eats together has a greater chance of getting high blood pressure together. <laughs> well, let's get into that in our weekly checkup. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us with more. All right, let's start with the story we just ran about, caffeinated lemonade. The yeah. drinks have up to 390 milligrams mm -hmm. of caffeine. Just speaking broadly here, how much caffeine is too much? What are the symptoms of caffeine intoxication? So one of their beverages had 390 milligrams of caffeine. The recommended upper limit of caffeine consumption for adults in the U.S. is about 400 milligrams. So okay. you're getting basically all of your caffeine with one of those. Imagine drinking two or three of them. Right. 400 milligrams of caffeine is roughly four to five cups of coffee. Okay. You know, that have general amount. Oh, wow. That's a lot of coffee, too. It's, it's for, a fair amount. And yeah. remember, too, like espresso versus like, like you have to do your homework to know how much mm -hmm. ca how much um, caffeine you're actually consuming in those drinks. But symptoms of too much caffeine, you can imagine. You can feel a headache, get a headache, nauseous. You can feel anxious. Mm -hmm. You can feel dizzy at very, very, very high amounts. You can also have seizures. And they absolutely can be a medical emergency. And too much caffeine, 100%, can result in death. Wow. Okay, so watch your caffeine intake there. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, according to a new survey, this one seems kind of obvious, but apparently we do have some, some new information out of Ohio State University. People ditching their healthy habits during the holidays. I totally am guilty of this, yes. but what, what do we need to know about this? Well, so first of all, you can imagine we have so much to do. You have to buy presents, you're traveling, you're, you're overscheduled, going to parties and things like this. What the survey found was that two thirds of people surveyed overindulged in food. About 45% of people take a break from their regular exercise and over half of people report feeling tired and that they are short on time. My doctor's orders are um, if you know that you're going to have a busy week, plan your meals ahead of time. Make portions that you know you can stick with. If you're going to a big party at night, load up on a high protein meal during the day so that you're not so hungry in the evening. That's a good thing. Saying no goes a long way, right? <laughs> so just say no Tough thanks. Though. Tough um, though. Try not, try not to, try not to sample every single hors d'oeuvre, for example, and, <laughs> st and stick to your normal routine. And by that, I, oh, you're laughing at that. And by that, I mean I love doing that. Also. Sleep 
sleep. If you're traveling, try to stay on the same sleep schedule. Definitely try to stay on your same exercise schedule. All right, we're 10 on time. I want to make sure yeah. we for sure get to this yeah. one. New okay. research published in the Journal of the American Heart Association says one person in a relationship has high blood pressure. Yeah. It's likely the other one does yeah. too. Also, Why is that? So this is fast. I was very fascinated when I read this headline. So let's start first. 50% of U.S. adults have hypertension. In this study that they surveyed, more than 35% of couples over the age of 50 both had high blood pressure and wives are 9% more likely to have high blood pressure if their husbands mm. do. And this relationship oh. was even stronger in other countries like China and India where couples tend to do things together most of the time. So you can the inference here is that behaviors that you do together could contribute to high blood pressure. So if you have behaviors that you can work on, have these health conversations together as a couple, schedule your appointments with, with the doctor together, and share lifestyle changes, whether that is exercise, diet, quitting smoking. If you get blood pressure together, you can also unget blood pressure together, <laughs> is my theory. I thought your doctor's orders were going to be spend less time together. Uh, or, or, yeah, well, you know I what, Joe? You <laughs> for a few things. interpret it as you would like to, Joe. <laughs> doctor says. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hazel. With some financial headlines, starting with good news for Hollywood's actress this morning. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Silvana, good morning. Joe, Savannah, good morning. Yes, yeah, some good news indeed. Members of the sag aftra Actors Union have approved a new three-year contract with major studios. This officially ends six months of labor disputes in Hollywood that halted production of TV shows and movies. The union says nearly 80% of those who voted support the deal with Netflix, Disney, and others. The new contract provides pay raises and streaming bonuses. The union says amount to more than $1 billion over three years. It also includes protections around the use of artificial intelligence in filmmaking. A majority of Americans feel the U.S. economy is already in a recession despite recent data showing positive signs. A new survey from Bankrate shows 59% of adults believe the economy is in a downturn, while 50% say their overall financial situation has gotten worse since the 2020 election. Nearly two-thirds say the economic environment has negatively impacted their finances this year. More than three in five adults have changed their financial habits. And Disney will release three Pixar movies in theaters early next year after they were only available on Disney Plus during the pandemic. Soul will hit the big screen on January 12th, Turning Red on February 9th, and Luca in March. Each movie will be accompanied by a short film. Tickets go on sale January 2nd, and the theater releases could help Disney's bottom line as it's only slated to put out one Marvel film next year, which is Deadpool 3, and one Pixar movie, Inside Out 2, guys. All right, oh, Silvana, thank you so for much. Both of those, yeah. by the way. Silvana, thank you. Well, this morning yeah. we're learning new details about a proposed plan that would allow colleges and universities to pay student athletes. As NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky explains, the idea being floated by the NCAA would completely change the landscape of big-time college sports. A bold idea from the NCAA president, proposing for the first time ever, schools be allowed to pay student-athletes. The potential shift could impact a policy passed two years ago that allowed players to earn money through endorsements outside of school. NCAA President Charlie Baker now wants to allow schools to take part. In a letter to more than 350 Division I schools, Baker called for an entirely new athletic division to be created. Participating schools would invest at least $30,000 for each qualifying athlete, male or female, annually, and work with the NCAA to craft different rules for the new division. Baker noting 59 schools already spend more than $100 million annually on athletic programs. Schools already responding. I think it's going to be really good for uh, college athletics, and we're excited to be a part of it. Let's finally figure out the best way to move forward in a way that takes care of our student athletes very well, um, allows us to be competitive across our conferences. Do you see this potentially leveling the playing field? Not particularly. It, it, college sports has never had a level playing field. If a school wants to spend a lot more money on football players and offer them a lot more, they can do that as long as they spend an equal amount of money for female athletes on the other side of that as well. A long-standing playbook on its way to changing. Morgan Chesky, NBC News. For more now, we are joined by senior writer at The Athletic, Chris Vanini. Chris, thank you as always for joining us. So this movie is being called potentially revolutionary in the world of college sports, but 
What would it mean for an everyday fan? Do you think schools are likely to embrace this? And what's this going to look like if you're just a fan of some of these sports? I think we've seen in the NIL era over the past couple of years that fans are pretty fine with it. The TV ratings this year were higher than they've been in a very long time. Attendance has been back up. I don't think NIL has been something that has turned fans away very much. And in some cases, it's kept really good players in college instead of leaving early for the pros. So I think this is a move, obviously, it's a much greater step forward and impacts a lot more athletes. But from the fan perspective, I don't think this is going to be all that noticeable when you're watching football games on Saturdays. If it comes to be, could we potentially see national championships decided with teams from inside this proposed new division playing teams outside of it? It's possible. Uh, it's still very early in this whole stage. I mean, if you look at the basketball uh, national championship this year, we had San Diego State, which is in what is considered a group of five conference going up against uh, UConn, which is in the Big East. Football would be a lot more difficult. We don't typically see group of five teams playing for the national championship. But the but the playoffs, football and basketball, may be adjusted around this as well. We've had a new 12 team football playoff coming next year. So it is a possibility where a greater divide becomes between the haves and the half nots, but the money's already there. It's just being spent on coaching salaries and other things and said this way, a lot of it would now finally go to the athletes. Yeah, so I mean, what is the impact on schools in and outside of this, you know, so-called power conference? We Again, we, we don't totally know yet. This is very much a very early proposal and an idea, but you've seen coaching salaries explode over the last 10 years. We've got a lot of football coaches making more than $10 million. Texas A&M just fired a coach who has a $76 million buyout. And so the NCAA is facing a lot of lawsuits down the pipe that could turn athletes into employees, that could result in NIL back payments, that could really blow the entire thing up. And NCAA leaders, conference administrators, have been going to Congress lobbying for an antitrust exemption. And by putting this proposal forward, they can go to Congress and say, look, we have a plan in place if you can give us that exemption around NIL. We saw this change in student athletes being able to make money when these name, image, and likeness deals came to be that major development. But I mean, the vast majority of players that maybe not be making that much from that. So what would this mean for players, for athletes? It would mean a lot more athletes are making a lot more money. A big part of this obviously would be to abide by Title IX, which means male and female athletes would have to make the same amount of money from the school. And if it's a $30,000 minimum, uh, for at least half of your athletes. That's a pretty big investment. That you're talking could range between $6 million and $15 million annually for a school. And so th that's separate from NIL. The schools can uh, would, would be able to enter into NIL deals with athletes on top of that. And so it could greatly expand NIL as well. So it'd be a lot more money going to a lot more athletes, especially uh, when it comes to female athletes, because basketball and football players are the ones driving the revenue toward these schools through television deals. All right, Chris, thank you so much for joining us on this. Welcome back. You might remember Barbenheimer, a name that we all sort of made up to refer to Barbie and Oppenheimer movies. Well, they premiered in theaters on the same day over the summer. Many people turned it into a double feature, but it turns out the Barbenheimer opening weekend was close to maybe not happening. That is according to Barbie actress and producer Margot Robbie in Variety Magazine's Actors on Actors interview. Robbie told Oppenheimer actor Killian Murphy that Oppenheimer producer Charles Roven suggested Robbie change Barbie's release date, to which Robbie replied, quote, we're not moving our date. If you are scared to be up against us, then you move your date. Of course, Robbie was right not to budge. While both films were among this year's highest grossing films, Barbie came out on top, making 1.4 billion, yes, billion dollars worldwide compared to Oppenheimer's also impressive $950 million. I think what the lesson time. here is they helped each other. I mean, that's yes. really what happened there. Yeah, so definitely. it was a good thing the that they were together on the same weekend. Yeah, exactly. It's not what they wanted initially. The, Margaret said, no, no, no. There you go. Maybe a lesson for other movies in the <laughs> yeah. future. Maybe you want to be on the same weekend with someone. Mark it together. All right, speaking of Barbie, we're going to end this hour with even more girl power. Forbes magazine has just revealed its 20th annual list of the world's 100 most powerful women. Yeah, these are true hashtag girl bosses who define 2023 in every sphere from politics and
and business to tech and entertainment and more. You can see some of their pictures there. To break it all down, we are now joined on set by Maggie McGrath. She's a senior editor over at Forbes Women. Maggie, thank you so much for being here. Love this list. Fascinated by some of it and jumping right in. Speaking of Barbie, including, of course, many heavy hitters, politicians we're going to get into, but she is actually on this list. Tell us about that. So Barbie, as a figure, ranked at number 100. And the reason for that is every year we use the number 100 spot to highlight someone who is not traditionally powerful in the hard power sense. She's not a world leader. She's not a CEO like the other people on the list. But we saw the power of the Barbie movie. We see the power of her figure. She made her debut to the world in 1959. She has had 250 careers. Years, and I've spoken to consumer <laughs> behavior experts to talk about how that's a model for girls who are playing with it. Mm. When they play with astronaut Barbie, lawyer Barbie, they can see themselves as astronauts and lawyers. But beyond that, we saw the power of the consumer. She tapped into that power of the female dollar this year. Mm. So for all of these reasons and the Big message time. of empowerment, she's number 100. So yeah, Barbie, Beyonce, and Taylor Swift, they were really seen as like the powerhouse trifecta uh. this year, bringing in billions and basically anything that they touch. I mean, we like to say girls run the world. This really was the year of the woman in entertainment, wasn't it? it if nothing else, the summer yeah. of women, yeah. right? Because we started off the year, if you look broadly at female power, we lost some world leaders. They either stepped down or lost their seats. Some certain very powerful CEOs stepped down from their perch. But when you look at this summer, you have the power of Taylor Swift. I mean, the U.S. Travel Association estimates that her tour added more than $5 billion to state economies across the country. And I think they're adding to that number as the final year numbers come in. You have Beyonce. Her tour did 600 million, and her movie, which debuted this weekend, did one of the best box off domestic openings we've seen for an early December movie. Yeah. So they're tapping into their power as celebrities, as entertainers. I think you have the power of their lyrics, the power of the music that so many people like to enjoy. And then you have the power of community at mm -hmm. these events. I think everyone was craving community this year. Absolutely. Speaking of entertainers, what I thought was interesting, Rihanna's also on the list. So we've got Taylor, Beyonce, and Rihanna. They also happen to be the three youngest on the list, right? Yes. There's a couple other millennials on the list, but what do you think that says just kind of when we're talking about powerful women and age diversity within this list that that's all kind of the entertainment sector mostly? I mean, we as Forbes look at Rihanna and Taylor and Beyonce as entrepreneurs and Rihanna mm. has Fenty Beauty and that's part of why she is on this list. It is not just that she is an entertainer. Mm -hmm. She is a tremendously effective entrepreneur and businesswoman. And this list does look at hard metrics. We look at money. We look at revenue. We look at valuation. We look at social media followers. There's true hard power in what these women command in terms of their audience, in terms of the financial reach of their platforms. What do you think this list tells us in terms of who ranks where the top 10 about progress that we're making? <laughs> Well, to your question about millennials and about the progress, I think what this list shows is we have a lot farther to go. Mm. I think women are still so grossly underrepresented at levels of glo global leadership. If you look at the G20, you have Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, and you have Georgia Maloney, the Italian prime minister. Other than that, it's all men. And then, like you said, there are so many women in their 50s and 60s and 70s, which on one hand shows the ways that women can step into their power. But in the other ways, I think I question, are we doing enough on the caregiving and family leave policies to support mm. parents? Because if you think about when women are in their prime childbearing years and the way they can be dinged for that in the corporate world and the entrepreneurial world, we have a lot farther to go. But Susan Lee, the CFO of Meta, she was appointed to her position at 36. Mm -hmm. We have Amazing. Suyon Choi. Uh, she's the yeah. CEO of Naver in South Korea. Um, and she's at, right at the tail end at 42. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that window. Maggie McGrath, fascinating. Thank you for sharing this list with us. Thanks for being on set. Thanks. Love having you. It's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Good morning. Thank you for joining us this Wednesday. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, terror in Texas. Law enforcement officials in Austin say one man is in custody after killing six people Tuesday in a multi-city shooting spree. What we know about the man suspected of pulling the trigger. 
In the Middle East this morning, an escalating assault in Gaza. Israel's military now says its troops are in the heart of southern Gaza's main city. The advance is making the path for vital humanitarian aid there all the more treacherous. We're going to bring you the latest in a moment. Back here in the States, millions across the Pacific Northwest are facing catastrophic flooding with heavy rains pushing rivers there to a breaking point. We're on the ground with more on when the region could see some clearer skies. And yes, it's that time of the year again. Later in the hour, we'll bring you Time's Person of the Year. I know what morning news now anchor is rooting for one of the finalists, Taylor Swift, to rack up yet another win this year. Spoiler alert. There was the cover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll dig deeper into that coming up in just a moment. We sure will. All Can't right. wait. We're going to begin, though, with some breaking news out of Texas overnight. A series of shootings stretching from the San Antonio suburbs to Austin has left at least six people dead and others hurt. That includes two police officers. Yeah, suspect is now in custody, and officials are saying they were not aware the shootings were possibly linked until after that arrest. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky has the latest. Yeah, we've been following new details on this all night long, and each shooting incident taken by itself is frightening enough. But when police made the announcement that all of these might be connected to just one individual, there was an absolutely chilling feeling that followed. And even though that suspect is now in police custody, investigators are on a desperate search for answers. Uh, there was a shot fired call at uh, Nelson Field. He said he's been hit. You said the officer has been hit? This morning, a man under arrest after a day of terror in Texas, accused of a string of shootings over more than eight hours in multiple locations, including a school, though no children were hurt. Authorities not connecting the shootings until Tuesday night when the suspect was charged with capital murder. Based on information obtained over the course of these investigations, we strongly believe one suspect is responsible for all of the incidents. The suspect is in custody and no longer poses a threat to our Austin community. On Tuesday morning, Northeast Early College High School was put on lockdown after shots were heard. The suspect, who police say is a man in his 30s, allegedly injured a school resource officer, but no students were involved. Then, a man and a woman killed in an Austin area further south, followed by another incident. The suspect allegedly shooting a cyclist who was injured. Finally, on Tuesday evening, police received a burglary call at a house. It's asking me assistance. Hey, with radio for green hot shot for 376, Astral Loop. Shots were fired. Changing shots with a suspect who injured an officer, fled in a vehicle, and then crashed during the chase. Police later finding two more bodies inside that house. Authorities also say the suspect may be tied to a separate shooting about an hour away in the San Antonio area where two more bodies were found in a residence. The local sheriff's department says the suspect has links to that home. Authorities still searching for a motive for these six killings. The nature of the relationship, if any, between the victims and the suspect is unknown. But this morning, those Texas communities now breathing a sigh of relief as a suspect is behind bars. Right now, investigators have not shared if the suspect has said anything upon being taken into custody. They remain in Travis County Jail in Austin, and police say this is very much a dynamic situation as they look over each one of these individual crimes and link them to that one individual. We'll send it back to you. All right, Morgan Chesky, thank you so much. Fighting between Israeli forces and Hamas reached new heights in Gaza overnight, and Palestinian citizens are being left with fewer and fewer places to seek shelter. NBC News foreign correspondent Richard Engel is in southern Israel with the latest. We are on a Israeli military base not far from Gaza, and commanders here tell us that Israeli forces have already destroyed large parts of Hamas's tunnel network under the Gaza Strip, in some cases blowing up the entrances and trapping Hamas fighters inside. But the cost of this Israeli military operation to the people of Gaza is enormous. The Israeli military says its troops are now in the most intense fighting of the two-month war so far, battling with Hamas deep in Gaza, on the streets, in buildings, on foot, and in tanks. But this war is turning Gaza home to 2.3 million people who can't leave into a moonscape of destruction. These images are from Deir el-Balakh in central Gaza where six-year-old Lana Abu Safi was carried into a hospital by her uncle. 
I miss my mother and my arm. It hurts, she says. The Israeli military says it's instructing Gazans to evacuate areas of heavy fighting with millions of leaflets, phone calls, and maps of where to go. But in many cases, the messages aren't reaching or convincing Gazans, who say there is no safe place to go. When does the world move to stop this madness in Gaza? When? Until Gaza completely destroyed? Until there is no place called Gaza anymore? Many have fled to the southernmost tip of Gaza, to the city of Rafah on the Egyptian border. It's so overcrowded now, families are living on curbs. As we filmed, a man noticed our camera and said, don't bother, nobody cares. Israel says the war is not with the people of Gaza and that Palestinians are also victims of Hamas, which made them targets when the militants used Gaza as a base to massacre 1,200 people in Israel and take some 240 hostages. Israeli investigators say they have evidence Hamas fighters raped female victims on a wide scale. There are still more than 130 hostages in Gaza. Families and released hostages met with Prime Minister Netanyahu and his war cabinet Tuesday. They were angry. One warning that the remaining hostages don't have another second. More than 100 hostages are back in Israel after last week's truce. Yesterday, five-year-old Emilia Aloni returned to kindergarten after being held hostage for 49 days. The families of the hostages still in Gaza just released a joint statement saying that they've received intelligence that the conditions of the hostages have deteriorated due to untreated illnesses and injuries, and they're calling for immediate action to secure their release potentially returning to negotiations. All right, Richard Engel, thank you. Well, tonight, four Republican candidates for president will face off in Alabama for the fourth GOP presidential debate. And while former President Donald Trump, who is the clear frontrunner, will not take part, he did raise eyebrows overnight with comments he made during a town hall meeting in Iowa. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Hake is in Tuscaloosa, where the debate is being held. He joins us now with the latest on all this. Hey, Garrett, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. You know, just about six weeks to go into the Iowa caucus. This could very well be the final debate before Republican voters head to the polls and start the process of selecting their nominee. At center stage tonight, they will see Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis each trying to close that gap with frontrunner Donald Trump, who last night laughed off a question about whether he would try to become a dictator in a second term. Because it's a movement. Overnight during a taped town hall in Iowa, former President Trump mocking questions about turning the presidency into a dictatorship. Moderator Sean Hannity asking Mr. Trump if he had any plans to abuse his power or break the law if he were reelected or to seek retribution against others. I love this guy. He says, You're not going to be a dictator, are you? I said, No, 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 other than day one. We're closing the border. And we're drilling, drilling, drilling. After that, I'm not a dictator. Oh, that, okay? that, that, that. The Biden campaign quick to respond, writing in a statement, quote, Donald Trump has been telling us exactly what he will do if he's reelected. And tonight, he said he will be a dictator on day one. Just days ago, former Congresswoman Liz Cheney expressing similar concerns about an abuse of presidential power to Savannah. You've said we are sort of sleepwalking into dictatorship in the United States. Dictatorship. Is that what we yeah. would have if we reelect Donald Trump? I think it's it's a very, very real threat and concern. And, and I don't say any of that lightly. Earlier Tuesday at a fundraiser in Boston, President Biden telling donors, quote, if Trump wasn't running, I'm not sure I'd be running, but we cannot let him win. Returning to the White House, the president making clear he's staying in this race. Did you drop out of Trump right now? No, not now. Meanwhile, Mr. Trump will not take part in tonight's GOP debate as the shrinking Republican presidential field gathers in Tuscaloosa. At center stage, Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, both trying to establish themselves as the party's best alternative to Trump. I think Nikki Haley really represents uh, the last gasp of a failed establishment. Well, I think he went after my record as governor because he's losing. I mean, who else can spend $100 million and drop half in the polls? While on the wings, long-shot candidates Chris Chris Christie and Vivek Ramaswamy trying deeply divergent strategies. Ramaswamy embracing Donald Trump, Christie vowing to take him on directly. Hope is not a strategy. If you want to beat someone, you need to go out and tell people why he's not right for the job and why you are. 
And Donald Trump continues to run his parallel campaign to the rest of the field. Tonight, he'll be at a fundraiser in Florida. Tomorrow, he is likely to attend his civil fraud trial in New York City, mostly focused on the general election and on his legal challenges. Interestingly enough, a general election, he said last night, he's not sure will be against President Biden. Savannah? All right, Garrett. Hey, thank you so much. A months-long standoff over the promotions of hundreds of top-ranking military officials is finally over, or at least mostly over, on Capitol Hill. Yeah, Alabama Republican Senator Tommy Tuberville lifted his blanket hold last night, and the Senate immediately confirmed the promotion of more than 400 officers. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles joins us now. So, Ryan, first of all, let's start with the basics. Remind us why Tuberville was doing this in the first place and why it appears he's back down now. Yeah, so Joe, this was uh, Senator Tuberville attempting to stand in the way of a Department of Defense policy that would allow service members that were posted up in states where abortion restrictions were put into place, the opportunity to travel to states where the procedure is legal so that they could take advantage of that health care opportunity. Uh, Tuberville was upset that the administration made that decision unilaterally and didn't involve Congress. And so he was using these this block on these military promotions as a way to get DOD to change course. They, of course, didn't, and that's what led to this months-long standoff, the backlog of more than 400 officers uh, that were expected to get promotions. Yesterday, after Tuberville lifted the hold, he talked to us about how he thinks this whole thing played out and who won and who lost. Take a listen. It was pretty much a draw. I mean, they didn't get what they wanted. We didn't get what we wanted. And, you know, just, when they when they change the rules, it's hard to it's hard to win. And so they changed the NDA, NDA rules. We didn't get to fight for it to leave it in the Senate. And so just unfortunate the American people didn't get a voice. So what Senator Tuberville is talking about there is that there was some talk that this would be a part of the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, senators chose to not go in that direction when he lost that opportunity to amend the NDAA, that's when he backed down. When he says it's a draw, though, Joe and, and Savannah, that's not necessarily the case. He literally did nothing to change this policy. The military promotions are going ahead as they were originally planned, just mm. a little bit later than what many expected. There are still some promotions being held up, though, right? Tell us about that. Yeah, so Tuberville allowed uh, the hold to be lifted for all promotions for three-star officers and below. There's still a small group of four-star and above officers. These are the highest-ranking officers in the military, some 11 different promotions that are still on hold. He's making that go through the lengthy process required uh, to be confirmed in the United States Senate. That's not necessarily out of the ordinary. Often, these generals and officers, admirals, uh, get a little bit more scrutiny under normal circumstances anyway. They will ultimately get promoted. It's just going to take a little bit longer than the 425 that we saw pass through last night. Ryan, while we have you, we want to ask you about an issue that continues to divide Congress. That's more military aid to Ukraine. We understand there was a classified Senate briefing on the matter, and it got a little heated yesterday. So what happened there? Yeah, and, and the reason it got heated, Joe, is because uh, Republicans are uh, tying this uh, debate over funding for Ukraine and Israel, for that matter, uh, to serious changes to the administration's border security policy. Uh, and they uh, attended a briefing yesterday with administration officials that was specifically aimed at talking about Ukraine and Israel and started asking questions about the border. Well, the briefers weren't there to talk about the border. They weren't experts on the border. And that made Republicans mad. They felt the administration should have been more focused on that as well. It led to a shouting match, we're told, inside this classified briefing. And many of the Republicans just got up and left. Democrats are frustrated that Republicans are making this important issue political. But the sum total of all of this is that there remains a divide over how to move forward. And as a result, these four crucial pieces of legislation, these, this supplemental aid package that would help Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, and uh, lead to fixes at the southern border is at a standstill. And many believe it has to get done before Christmas if it's going to get done at all. And that's a real problem, particularly for Ukraine, who feels Russia's encroaching as the winter approaches. All right, Ryan, thank you so much. Well, this morning, millions of people across the Pacific Northwest are dealing with severe flooding and mudslides from what's known as an atmospheric river that's been bearing down on the region this week. The U.S. Coast Guard has stepped in to rescue five people from areas in Oregon, while some schools, train lines, and roads were shut down across Washington. Look at this dramatic video. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer is in Washington State with the latest for us. 
powerful cascading torrents tore across communities near Seattle. Fueled by days of drenching rain, dangerous walls of water triggered flood alerts for some 9 million across the Pacific Northwest. At least five raging rivers are threatening to breach their banks, some already partially submerging homes, cars, and roads. It doesn't matter if it's a couple inches or a full foot um, of water or anything in between. It's a very dangerous situation. In Oregon, the flash flooding turned deadly as emergency teams race from rescue to rescue. The Coast Guard swooping in to pluck one driver from their truck while also hoisting another family from their home after it was surrounded by rising water. With three major storms dumping a conveyor belt of steady rain, up to eight inches could fall across the Pacific Northwest by Thursday. I didn't expect for it to rise this quickly. A waterlogged region desperate to dry out, but this morning still on the brink of disaster. And that was Miguel Almaguer putting there for us. Keep the weather going with a look at some possible warm, record warm temperatures for December in the midsection of the country. Andrew Lassman's back with that. Hey, Andrew, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. We're still going to deal with moisture, making a beeline for the coast out there in the Pacific. But we've got some record warmth that we're dealing with. And here's why. We've got a massive ridge that has built across most of the western portions of the United States. We've got that quick moving Alberta clipper system that we were tracking yesterday that's ushered in some chilly air from Canada. So really, as we look to the north, East, the mid-Atlantic and even parts of the southeast temperatures are a little below normal not anything crazy but running four or five degrees below where they should be so places like Washington DC end up in the mid 40s today Nashville mid 40s Buffalo 33 degrees that's not crazy but when you look out towards Denver that's where that ridge is in control we're seeing temperatures 20 25 degrees above normal for this time period in December we've got 67 on tap for Rapid City today 68 for Denver by this afternoon and up Upper 50s stretch from Omaha down to Wichita, Oklahoma City will hit the low 60s by later this afternoon. And it's not just today. Tomorrow, too, that record December warmth will hold steady. 55 degrees in Minneapolis in December. That's going to feel balmy, I have a feeling, for folks there. We've got 64 on tap for Kansas City. Oklahoma City will set it into the upper 60s and the low 70s for folks in Amarillo for tomorrow. There will be the potential for some record highs, especially across parts of the northern plains and into the Midwest. We've got Waterloo. Minneapolis, Marquette, Sioux Falls, Grand Forks, Omaha all have the potential to see some record-breaking highs for tomorrow's date. So we'll keep an eye on that. Meanwhile, as we look ahead to the end of the work week and into the weekend, upper 50s for folks in Pittsburgh. We'll see Detroit hang out in those mid-50s for your Saturday plans. And we've got low 50s on Friday in New York. We end up into the mid-50s by Saturday. And look at that, Sunday, 60 degrees, mid-60s in Washington, D.C. It's going to be quite warm. I mentioned that we still have moisture moving on shore for folks across the Northwest, and we do. We've got 8 million people impacted by these flood alerts this morning, and moisture uh, still is, is going to be an issue, not just today, but in the coming days, too. But here's what it looks like right now on the radar. You can see across Washington, Oregon, plenty of rain still falling, and more to come through the day today, especially for portions of California. You'll start to see some of the heavy rain develop there, and even some snow across the Sierras uh, will start to pick up. Tomorrow, that system that we're tracking today moves a little farther inland. That'll bring some snow across the Rockies. But we'll also deal with another system that's going to work on shore, bringing more scattered showers across the Pacific Northwest uh, and unfortunately more on tap for this weekend. Speaking of the weekend, here's Friday. The east looks great, sunny, mild. We've got the heavy snow that will look across parts of the west. And then we see a system that's going to work from west coast to east coast, bring the potential for some really strong storms on Saturday uh, to places across the south. We'll watch for that closely. Snow and wind across parts of the Midwest and into the plains. And then there's that other storm that I mentioned. We'll see another one moving on shore for the Pacific Northwest on Saturday. More moisture on tap, so likely more flooding and additional snowfall with some cooler air in place. It won't be hard for us to get a, a little more snowfall this time. Looking ahead to Sunday, those snow showers continue there, but look how much rain is on tap for uh, mo basically the eastern third of the country. We'll get some wind, we'll get some rain, and we also will see some snow across parts of the Great Lakes uh, stretching down to the Ohio Valley. Uh, the place to be, I guess, on Sunday is, I don't know, Texas, 60 degrees <laughs> with a little bit of sunshine, uh, maybe Southern California, mid-70s out in L.A. that day. But um, plenty of plenty of impactful weather over the next couple of days, guys. Did say negative 12 in Alaska? 
Yes, those are, you got good eyes. <laughs> I actually don't, but I was just really studying oh, that for a while. Work. <laughs> yeah. Alaska does get cold this time of year. For sure. <laughs> We are back with a controversial plan that could threaten abortion rights in New Hampshire. Four Republican legislators in the state are planning to introduce a bill that would ban abortion at 15 days gestational age. For more on this, we are joined by NBC News reporter Jane Tim. Hey, Jane, good morning. So explain to us what this proposal actually means and walk us through the reaction it's seeing. Savannah, this bill would effectively be an outright abortion ban. Gestational age in pregnancy is calculated from the first day of the woman's last period, which means that at 15 days, a woman may or may not have ovulated an egg yet, and a fertilized egg, if it exists, has not implanted in the uterine wall. And that's when the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology says pregnancy actually begins. Science aside, there's not really a way to tell if you will become pregnant or if maybe you're, the, there's a fertilized egg that could implant in the uterine wall. There is no way of really knowing if you're pregnant or going to become pregnant at 15 days gestational age. I have to imagine there's some strong reaction to this. So what are we hearing? Does it have any chance at all of being approved? You know, New Hampshire's government is, well, Republican controlled in all three chambers or cha uh, parts of government. Um, it, it's pretty unlikely. Governor Sununu signed a 24 week abortion ban a few years ago, and he said he's a pro choice governor up till that point. Uh, the uh, House in New Hampshire is divided by two or three members, which essentially means that attendance in that state decides the majority of the day. Uh, abortion has been a really polarizing subject. It's going to be very difficult to move from 24 weeks to 15 days. Uh, in this. It, it seems unlikely to pass. This is the political point they're trying to make here. Jane, coincidence or not that this is being discussed right before the primary? You know, these members uh, I spoke to sort of said that they would support any uh, abortion ban. That they, One of them said, I'm also supporting a 15-week abortion ban. Anything that restricts abortion, I'm going to do. Um, I think Democrats very much want to be talking about this. They want to put this in the spotlight. It has been a turnout machine for Democrats to talk about abortion rights. Uh, so for them, uh, it's no coincidence at all. Jane Tim, thank you so much. Now to a serious problem affecting everyone who flies, the issue of pilot mental health. It's in the spotlight after some scary incidents involving pilots behaving erratically in the cockpit. NBC's Tom Costello has more on what's being done to address the concerns. Hey, Joe and Savannah, good morning. You know, today the NTSB is holding a roundtable discussion to address the urgent concerns about pilot mental health. The board says current protocols for screening pilots simply are not good enough. And that could lead to a serious problem in the sky. When you board a flight, you assume the pilot is mentally fit to fly. But aviation and mental health experts say current regulations cause too many pilots to keep their struggles a secret, leading to mental health breakdowns, some in flight. Today, the NTSB is holding a summit with experts to develop solutions. What's unsafe is not getting people the help they deserve. Take the case of veteran pilot Joseph Emerson. We've got the uh, guy that tried to shut the engines down uh, out of the cockpit. In October, Emerson tried to shut down the engines of an Alaska air flight while hitching a ride in the cockpit. A grand jury is now indicting him on 83 misdemeanor counts of reckless endangerment and one count of endangering an aircraft. Emerson has pleaded not guilty. In court filings, he claimed he was having a mental health emergency. He told police he'd been depressed for six years, had recently lost a friend, and had taken psychedelic mushrooms 48 hours prior to the flight. Experts say contributing to the bigger problem, the FAA relies on pilots to self-report mental health issues. While periodic medical exams require pilots to disclose if they're in mental health treatment, the exams do not include in-depth psychological evaluations. A recent Inspector General report found this limits the FAA's ability to mitigate safety risks because pilots are reluctant to disclose mental health conditions due to the stigma and the fear it will hurt their careers. We need to have a system that allows people to be more forthcoming and to have treatment for issues that shouldn't keep you out of the cockpit. On Monday, the FAA announced it is creating a special committee now to identify barriers that discourage pilots from reporting mental health issues. The FAA says most conditions, if treated, will not disqualify a pilot from flying. We have to normalize mental health care. We have to make sure the choice isn't 
receive treatment or fly. The Airline Pilots Association says it supports these initiatives. It also wants to see the FAA fund a peer support training program for pilots that would encourage them to confide in each other and then help connect them with mental health resources and to help them keep their jobs as well. Joe and Savannah, back to you. All right, Tom Costello, thank you so much. Let's get to international headlines now. Russian President Vladimir Putin is in the Middle East where the UN climate conference is taking place. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudia Lavanga joins us from Rome with that and other world headlines. Claudia, good morning. Joe Savannah, good morning. Well, that's right. Vladimir Putin has now arrived today in the uh, United Arab Emirates, just as Dubai is hosting the COP28 United Nations Climate Change Conference. And this will be his first uh, step, a stopover in the region before he moves on to Saudi Arabia. Now the Russian president faces an arrest warrant for the, uh, from the International Criminal Court over the war in Ukraine. But Saudi Arabia and the UAE have not ratified the statute that governs the International Criminal Court, meaning they have no obligation to arrest. Now let's go to Peru, where the Constitutional Court ordered the immediate release of former President Alberto Fujimori from prison. 85-year-old Fujimori was serving a 25-year sentence in connection with the death squad slaying of 25 Peruvians in the 1990s. In 2017, the former president was granted a pardon that was later annulled. Now the court has ruled he should be released on humanitarian grounds. And let's end the sort of the world in South Korea, where four more members of BTS, one of the world's most popular K-pop bands, will soon begin their military duties. News that all members had to serve their time in the military as every other man their age in South Korea caused widespread distress among fans. Three members of BTS are already serving. The remain four will soon face the music and dance their way to the military barracks. Back to you guys. Oh, all right, Claudio, thank you so much. We're back with a big reveal, Time's Person of the Year for 2023. Every year since 1927, Time has selected the man, woman, group, or concept that had the most influence on the world during the previous 12 months. Sam Jacobs is Time's Editor-in-Chief and joins us now with more, uh, I think the cat's out of the bag, we know. That's, <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Person of the Year is, uh, and we talk about Taylor Swift and how you decided to pick her this year. It's never an easy choice. We're trying to pick one person to represent 8 billion people on the mm -hmm. planet. Um, but I think in a year when there was a lot of light and darkness in a divided world where our institutions are failing, Taylor Swift works. If you look at the success that she's having, um, people had to get involved in a competition to find new ways to describe how much influence she had. We had scientists describing the earthquakes that her fans caused. We had <laughs> economists comparing her work to gross domestic product of countries. She exceeded expectations both within her field and outside of her field. And for that reason, we're recognizing Taylor Swift as Time's 2023 Person of the Year. So as you've probably gathered in the moments you've been sitting on set with us, I am not only a journalist who was excited to hear who Person of the Year is, I am a Swifty, full disclosure. And I mean, this is making some really big news because you interviewed her, which is really the first time she's given an interview in nearly four years, right? Taylor Swift was like the weather in 2023. You could not go <laughs> anywhere and talk to someone and not have something to talk about if you mention the words Taylor yeah. Swift. Despite that ubiquity, she doesn't really talk to the mm -mm. press. She hasn't given an interview, or particularly an interview like this, in nearly four years. And so we were able to talk with her about what exactly this experience was like, what this year like felt to her, put it in the context of her career, her relationships, the music industry. And she describes a story that maybe to us feels like success after success, but she's had some really tough moments. And what's interesting is she traces a lot of the success and influence she's had this year to coming back from those setbacks. Absolutely. What's surprised you the most from what you heard from her? Uh, hearing someone who is at the pinnacle of her influence being so comfortable with herself. Mm. The, there's a sense of self-acceptance that comes through, and that's part of the reason why we recognize her for this, because I think she's sending that self-acceptance out to the world. You say you hear from a lot of insecure celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell us uh, some of the stuff that I, I know people are surprised to be hearing about, like how she prepped for this tour that's been absolutely record-breaking. She's never talked about that, and you heard a little bit about her relationship. Sure. Uh, we can start there. Uh, obviously, uh, Taylor Swift's relationship with football player Travis Kelsey has been one of the main storylines mm -hmm. of this year. She has made the most popular thing in America, football, <laughs> even more popular by her mere presence. And she herself talks about, like, why was I missing this my whole life? Football is terrific. Um, and at the same time, she talks about what, uh, how they got together, uh, how they got to know each other. 
um, you know, the way in which they're experiencing this relationship out loud. We asked her, you know, what's it like to be dating so publicly? And she said, look, I just, we just like each other. We want to support each other. I go watch doing the things that he loves. He comes watch me do the things I love. As for the tour, what was amazing to hear was just how physical the preparation is for this. This mm. is a three and a half hour long tour that she does night after night across the planet. And part of that is she understands that people are spending a huge amount of money, giving up a ton of opportunity to show up. And so she's trying to give as much as she can to this tour. She talks about how she used to prepare for her tours like a frat guy. And now <laughs> she's incredibly serious. Three months of choreography training. She prepared for this tour by spending three and a half hours on the treadmill every day singing the entire show while she ran and you just see her commitment to her fans she says in this work and I think it's amazing to hear how how focused and disciplined she is and it, I think it takes that type of focus and discipline to do what to she's going to do she she's is. got a whole another year traveling all over the globe to do this as well new new year's resolution for people do three and a half yeah. hours on the treadmill while singing the entire <laughs> well, set one list. of her <laughs> about that, that I've seen so far that that I loved was her saying no matter if I'm something along the lines of injured heartbroken sick I'm going on that stage she said to us I cannot imagine doing the era's tour hungover yeah. and I completely <laughs> understand if you watch this performance what oh, yeah. she's doing night after night and learning the choreography she says she gets that in her bones she uh, emma stone recommended to her the choreographer from la la land oh. to help create oh. this show and and she now just does it like no one else can we have less than a minute here but we have to ask you it looks like there's three covers to this sure. is that right and one of them has a cat yes uh, we, we would about the like to introduce the world to the ragdoll cat benjamin, benjamin button. button this is taylor <laughs> swift's cat anyone who is a fan of taylor swift knows that she is passionate oh, yeah. about her cats and uh this gorgeous photograph by inez and Venude shows taylor with benjamin button uh <laughs> accompanying her to the photo shoot um and I think it just captures the the glamour, her sense of humor, uh, and mm -hmm. I don't think you'll see a cover like that anywhere else. In the world How do you today. get the cat to look? I mean, that's you know, and both not of their blue easy. eyes. It's just like, are you kidding me? All the pictures are gorgeous. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Sam Jacobs, thank you so much for joining wow, us this morning. So we appreciate cool. your time. Time to get you some financial headlines. The heads of the nation's biggest banks are headed back to Capitol Hill today. CNBC Silvana Hanau has that and other money news for us. Silvana, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Savannah. Yes, so the CEOs of the nation's biggest banks are headed to Capitol Hill today to testify before the Senate Banking Committee. The heads of J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, and others will warn lawmakers new regulations will hurt credit and the broader economy. The rules in question will require banks to hold more cash in reserve to protect against potential losses. J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon will say that could hurt a bank's ability to lend to households and businesses. Amazon is cutting fees for merchants who sell cheaper clothes. It's a sign that it's gearing up for a price war with Shein. That's the Chinese fast fashion upstart. Amazon announcing yesterday it would lower fees for sellers on its platform for clothing priced below $15 to 5%. Rates on clothes priced from $15 to $20 will drop to 10%. And Bloomberg reports it's rare for Amazon to reduce those fees as it tries to entice merchants who sell cheaper apparel, an area where Xi'an has excelled. Amazon is facing competition from companies with ties to China like Xi'an, Timu, and TikTok, which launched a U.S. shop earlier this year. And shares of South Korea's YG Entertainment soared nearly 30% today after members of the superstar K-pop group Blackpink renewed their contracts with the label. There had been speculation for months they wouldn't sign a new deal. Blackpink has the most viewed channel on YouTube with more than 90 million subscribers. The group just wrapped up a massive world tour this fall with more than 60 shows across the globe, guys. Wow, love Blackpink. Silvana, thank you so much. I do too. You got it. <laughs> Every year, the Make-A-Wish Foundation grants thousands of wish to ch wishes to children with illnesses all around the world. And this week, it decided to bring in some serious celebrity star power. NBC News correspondent Jacob Sobrock joins us now with this incredible story. Jacob, good morning. Hey, what's up, Joe? Yeah, you know, the Make-A-Wish Foundation does extraordinary, extraordinary work. And these kids are dealing with really what is unimaginable hardship that I don't think any of us can really relate to unless you're going through it. But one thing it does allow them to do is dream big. And for these kids, Dwayne Johnson was the dream of a lifetime. Watch. On a sparkling 78-degree December day in Southern California, a group of very special kids and their families began a journey to fulfill a wish. 
21 very deserving WISH children are getting their wishes granted to meet Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And they are over the moon excited. I'm his biggest fan. Best eyebrow. <laughs> All of it happened at Universal Studios Hollywood. I want to see your lip and arm wrestle. <laughs> Enter The Rock. Mr. Johnson. How are you, sir? Nice to see you. Good to see you. So today is one of the biggest days in Make-A-Wish history. It's unbelievable. We're in the back lot here at Universal, and they're going to be on a tram coming up. They have no idea I'm going to be here. He got back in the car. Here comes the tram. We got a pretty cool looking pickup truck over there. Yeah! I'm so good. It's so good to see you. Should I get on this tram with you guys? Yeah! All right, let's do it. For these kids and families, it was a dream come true. I mean, you know, we're going to meet them here, but I didn't know it was going to be like this. The Rock giving the Universal Backlot Tour. Toss Kevin Hart in the water. Yes! <laughs> but then the shark would still be hungry. Yeah, that's true. Pleasing his fans is in The Rock's DNA. And he took time throughout the day to do just that. What's the best part about the tour so far? Thank you. I was just fishing for that compliment. But make a wish, and these kids are in his heart and have been since his own dad, Rocky, granted the first New Jersey wish 40 years ago. This little boy named Bobby, I'll never forget it. His last wish was to meet my dad. It puts things in, into perspective for you right away. So for the last 25 years, he's followed in those footsteps, making wishes come true. You could pick any charity in any part of the country, any part of the world, really, to work with, but you have chosen this charity. Why? These are kids, and then the cards that they are dealt, they didn't ask for it, but they're playing these hands as best they can. You know, I'm, I, I get emotional. These kids are so strong. On a day where he was only supposed to spend an hour with these families, he spent five providing entertainment, hugs, and granting Adelaide's special wish. We're gonna get your foot. It was so clear that giving back is a genuine part of his character. I felt compelled to ask him about swirling presidential rumors. Today you get to help, you know, dozens of children. You sure you don't want to be president of the United States? <laughs> Um, here's what I could tell you with 100% certainty yeah. and surety is that I believe in uh, working hard, controlling the controllables, kicking ass, and always give back. That's what I could tell you. So it's not a How, no. You see what? It's not a no. <laughs> I see what I it's did? It's not a no. <laughs> and he's starting with these kids. What I love about days like today is it's a way for us to show people that there's a lot of good out there, man. So I like that. President Rock might have a ring to it as far as his uh, presidential ambitions, you guys. He says he's going to support the country no matter uh, who wins the election in 2024. But you heard him. He did not rule out uh, a future presidential run. And then as far as Make-A-Wish, it really is extraordinary, as I said, the work that they do. The Rock, every, they told me every time that he posts to his nearly 400 million Instagram followers, which is also hard to believe, they get this massive boost in support, which couldn't be more critical uh, at a time like now when there are so many wishes yet uh, to grant, you guys. That is incredible. What an amazing surprise for all those kids. He just does so much good for people. Oh, my God. And what a great organization. Welcome back. If you've been with us in Morning News Now for a bit, you know that our very own Savannah Sellers is a proud alum of the University of Colorado at Boulder. I sure am. Well, tomorrow marks the premiere of the second season of Amazon's streaming series that follows our now CU head football coach, Deion Sanders. I got to talk with Coach Prime fresh off being named Sports Illustrated Sports Person of the Year. And I started by asking him what might surprise us about this show that we're about to see. The brutal honesty, the truth is exciting, exhilarating, uh, electrifying. And now there's expectation because you want to see what transpired. You want to mm. see the highs, the lows, the ups and downs, the good, the bad, the wins, the losses. You want to get to know these young men. You want to see how we handle certain situations that occurred throughout the season. It, it's going to be fun and action-packed. I, I, I cannot wait for the public to see it. When I came in here, I felt the spirit of losing. You didn't even try to get to the darn ball, man. No commitment, no desire, no fight. We had to flush that immediately. What you did at Boulder, I mean, it was just incredible. The beginning of the season, the center of college football universe, uh, playing host yes. to ESPN's College Game Day. The Rock is there. <laughs> it was just so incredible. 
As an alum, 10 years ago, I mean, this was just such a shock to the system for people who have been around this program for a long time. Obviously, we didn't have Coach Prime on our side at the time, but did it surprise even you, the attention that it got in the beginning? No, because we, we garnished that same attention when we were at an HBCU, but it was just magnified by 10 and the cameras were really huge and the spotlight was there. So everywhere we went in the previous season, it was a sellout crowd. All the mm. home games were a sellout crowd. Now you get to the, the level that we're at now, every home game is sold out. Every road game is sold out. The television numbers are extraordinary, but you got to be ready. There's that same light that, that shows your success. It also mm. shows your blemishes. Absolutely. And then we hit a slide and we didn't regather ourselves. Anything you'd do over from this season if you had a magic wand and could? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things I would do over. There's a lot of things I would do over. There's a lot of things I wouldn't have done mm. as well. See, a lot of things people say, what would you do over? That's a brilliant and a great question. I love it. But you got to understand, let's go to the next level. Mm. There's a lot of things that have done. Such as? I wouldn't have made that decision in the beginning, so I wouldn't have had to uh, do all that. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> give me an example. Oh, uh, it's too many examples. Because my <laughs> you got to understand, my head is all the way around the corner. I'm thinking, I'm thinking of stuff around the corner right now. So it, it'll go viral. If I say what I really want to say, we're going viral. <laughs> Let's do it, Coach. Give it to it. Give it to an alum. <laughs> <laughs> we're going viral. And I know, I know my detractors. I promise you, if I say what I'm thinking, we're going viral. I love it, Coach. Are we going to get you for a while at Colorado? Is this yes. a destination job for you? I love Boulder, Colorado, and Colorado. I'm not chasing finances. I'm not chasing the bag. I'm not chasing notoriety. I'm not chasing hype. I love what I do, and I do what I love, and I love Boulder, Colorado. I don't plan on being anywhere else in my coaching career. It is my desire mm. to one day retire and just walk off, I, not walk off, I wanna ride off on a white horse with a black hat in the sunset in Boulder, Colorado. That winning a championship, that's what I wanna, mm. that's what I want, championships, plural. That's what I wanna do. Oh, we love to hear it. You can ride that horse right up the flat irons. There you go. <laughs> there you go. While I've got you, I do want to ask you quickly about Florida State. Um, of course, it's a school okay. you have a personal connection to, came to national fame and acclaimed playing for the Seminoles. They've been shut out of a chance at the championship, even though they had this perfect 13-0 record. What do you make right. of that? That's, that's tough, and I, I wouldn't know what to do if I'm in that mm. same situation. That, trust me, we, we, that would be a viral moment as well. Um, I promise you that would be a viral moment if I'm ever in that situation. I want to be in that situation, but I want the outcome to be different. That's tough. Uh, but in the same token, I understand business. I understand this is about business, not just football. And I'd be darn if you're going to leave Alabama out of a college football playoff. That's not going to happen. The big market like Texas, mm. that's not going to happen. You got to understand. And that's one thing that I've always understood about life. There's a business side to all of this. Mm. And I know it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Coach, before I let you go, I mean, you've, of course, transformed a football program, but you've also totally changed the energy of a city and made real impacts on the school. Applications Thank at the you. school are way up. You can see just in, like you mentioned, the stadium selling out. I know you've also even academically gotten involved with faculty recruitment. Doing all this while being a dad with most of your kids joining you at Colorado. With yeah, all of awesome. that in mind, what do you want your legacy to be? That's a brilliant question. Thank you so much for that mm. opportunity to answer this. I want to be known as one of the greatest fathers that ever lived mm. Mm -hmm. and a man that really challenged his people and his community to go and think outside the box, but also reach another level. Mm. That, that That's it. It has nothing to do with sports. It has nothing to do with personal gain or wealth. It's a great father. I think I'm one of the greatest fathers that ever lived. Mm. I, I really do. <laughs> I really do. And I'm mad at myself because my daughter's first basketball game for CU was uh, a few days ago, mm -hmm. and she hit a three. That was her first time playing because she broke her thumb, and I was not there. Mm. I'm so mad about that. I mean, that that 
that hurt me. Like that's the kind of stuff that hurt me that I didn't see her first bucket, you know, <laughs> as a Buffalo, but I get to be a father every darn day. So I can't lose, even though if we lose a game, so I, I'm winning. I, I can't know. lose. Deion Sanders, Coach Prime, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Also, thank you for what you're doing for our school. It's just so cool to see the way that that campus and that city has transformed. Thank you. And when you come back, I want to see you. <laughs> what I'm saying there is I will hold you to that right. because I would love to see him. Of course, our thanks to Coach Prime for taking the time. And that show, season two of Coach Prime, it debuts tomorrow on Amazon Prime. His enthusiasm is rather contagious. I know, right? <laughs> well, he's, just, he's, he's so much fun to get to talk to. This is so, we've seen that all the time, but yeah. actually getting to interview him myself, it was great. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you so much for that conversation. That'll do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stick with us, though, because the news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.